So welcome to Taliban Afghanistan two months in. This webinar has been organized by the University of Melbourne's Asia Institute and is supported by our journal, the Melbourne Asia Review. My name is Scarlett Barnett and I'm a part of the Asia Institute team. And we would like to acknowledge that this event is being broadcast from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respect to elders past and present and I'd like to extend that acknowledgement and respect to any First Nations people who might be joining us today or watching the replay. This session is being recorded and we're also broadcasting live via Facebook. So if you're joining us through Zoom webinar, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions as we go along. So please go ahead and use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to ask anything, we'll try to respond to as many questions as we can. Now on to the discussion. I'm joined today by four very well-informed and experienced professionals. We have Ali Moore, uh, who is a journalist and a broadcaster, and she's working with Ear to Asia podcast and also a regular program host on ABC Radio Melbourne. We have Matt Nelson, who is an associate professor for Islam and politics in South Asia at Melbourne University. And Matthew is also a published author in the Melbourne Asia Review. We're also joined by Mina Zaki, who is a cybersecurity professional and has a background in communications, international relations, government and law. And finally, Amin Cycle A.M. Fassa, who is a professor of social sciences at the Centre for Muslim States and Societies within the University of Western Australia. Amin has also been widely published on the topic of governance and Afghanistan. So thank you for all joining us. We'll pass you over now to Ali, who will introduce the topic and lead us into the discussion. Thanks, Ali. Thank you, Scarlett, and uh, welcome to everyone, uh, both our panellists and uh, also those who are listening wherever and watching wherever you may be. Um, I wanted to start by saying this is a little bizarre, but I've never actually been to Afghanistan, but I lived in China for a number of years and I travelled west to Pakistan in the early 90s. And I raised that because back then, of course, it was right at the moment that the Taliban were first making themselves known. So I didn't cross the border. And now, of course, decades on, here we are again. And of course, also thousands and thousands of lives have been lost in the intervening decades. Afghanistan is very different today than it was back then in the early 90s. But the question is, how different is the Taliban and how different are the challenges that are facing the Afghan people. I think everyone watched those absolutely devastating images of Kabul airport. And as if they weren't enough, we've since seen the stories on the BBC of the family who sold their little girl in order to raise money to feed her siblings. And if you did see that story, the reporter, Yagita Lamai, she looks down the barrel of the camera and she points out that Afghanistan cannot wait while the world debates whether or not it's going to recognise the Taliban. And while the need is absolutely desperate, the reason that we're here today and the, the real topic for the conversation is the fact that the, the way forward is really fraught. How do you help without legitimising and without enabling? And uh, just as we're about to discuss, we're two months in after the Taliban take over Afghanistan. So where are we and, and what does Islamic governance look like and what will it look like in the future and what does that mean for women and for human rights more generally and indeed for regional and global security as well. They are enormous questions and so we're very privileged to have with us a panel who have both the professional and also the personal experience to help us find some answers to those questions. So very big welcome from me to Matthew and to Mina and to Armin. Thank you very much for joining us. I did want to start by maybe just giving a little bit of context to the question of governance under the Taliban, given how quickly they took over Afghanistan. Matthew, can I start by asking, what does the speed of that takeover say about the level of control the Taliban has over the country and how secure they are in their, their power to govern? Thanks, Ali. I, the pace question, I think, is a really good place to start. Um, the Taliban arrived in Kabul even more quickly, probably, than the Taliban themselves expected to arrive in, in Kabul. Um, we hear that after they sort of moved in, there were immediately disagreements within the Taliban um, about who would be on the front foot. 
Um, and I think some of those disagreements have continued to play out. And what we see really is I think, owing to the pace of the transition, uh, a focus on consolidating control. And, and what that consolidation process really involves in terms of these intra-Taliban disagreements is that um, the balance is tilting towards hardliners. Um, the balance is tilting towards hardliners who um, are being put in positions of authority and control over the army and the police. For instance, we see people like Sarajuddin Haqqani as the interior minister. We see people like Mullah Yaqub as the defense minister. These are hardliners. And, and the idea is that um, in the short term, they really need, they feel they need to focus on that domestic consolidation of control. Um, and, and some of the other uh, pathways that might have been considered might have been, um, the possibility might have been reduced because of the pace of that transition. I mean, do, do you agree with, with that assessment? And I guess that the follow on from that is, does that mean that in the shorter term, the focus of the Taliban is more likely to be on shoring up those internal positions or on building external support, or can they multitask? Well, I think I, go go ahead, I mean. Well, there, there is no question that, that the Taliban at the moment trying to consolidate their hold on the country as quickly as possible. But at the same time, as was pointed out, I mean, they have they are having internal problems, and of course, they are having enormous difficulties in uh, uh, obtaining international recognition. I mean, simply because uh, something like thirteen members of the Taliban interim uh, cabinet um, are on the United Nations blacklist, and uh, uh, as was also mentioned, uh, Sarajuddin Haqqani, the head of the uh, Haqqani network, is on the FBI wanted list. Uh, and as long as that remains the case, it's going to be very difficult to whether the country, whether the Taliban is run by the hardliners or by somewhat uh, more muted uh, members, uh, it, it's not going to be able to uh, function very effectively. And at the same time, there are really some resistance growing from inside the country. I mean, you, you've already had the, the National Resistance Front, which is led by um, Ahmad Massoud, the son of the legendary Afghan commander, Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was assassinated two days before 9-11 by Al-Qaeda agents. And of course, he fought the Al-Qaeda uh, and the Taliban uh, very valiantly for uh, quite some time. Um, uh, and there, uh, there's also uh, some civil um, uh, disobedience and civil movements which have really started in particularly by women and uh, by uh, the, the, those uh, women who have been on the forefront uh, of Afghanistan administration, judiciary, uh, education institutions, and so on. I mean, they can they can no longer really tolerate the, the uh, situation that the Taliban has brought upon them. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the Taliban's ideology has not changed, but of course their public relations tactics have really changed. They've got some a few good spokes uh, uh, people that to come uh, uh, front the international media and uh, uh, present the good face of the Taliban, but as far as the ideology is concerned, I think it's very much in the hands of those hardliners and that's going to remain the same, uh, the case for the foreseeable future. And I want to ask you about that, that I, I suppose that uh, the nuance that we might be seeing from the current Taliban leadership because it serves their purposes, but can I just bring Mina in? And I will, at the end of the conversation, obviously we'll return to this question of resistance, but how realistic, Mina, do you think a, a challenge is to the Taliban in the short term? Uh, thanks, Ali. I think that's a really good question and it's timely because we're seeing the resistance grow every single day. Um, you know, and this is like Professor Seikal said, it's not just the NRF, it's actually small pockets of people throughout the regions, um, particularly Kandahar. I mean, in Kandahar, you wouldn't think that they would have a resistance towards the Taliban. I mean, Kandahar is supposed to be their heartland, and yet you see protests against the Taliban happening quite often now. Uh, so that's just one example. But I just want to go back to the fact that, you know, uh, yes, these, the Taliban did come in and they didn't expect to, to uh, have such an easy path. And I just want to discuss why they came in so quickly. And I think the reason for that was because the democratically elected government of Afghanistan was not consulted. They were not brought to that um, negotiation table. And so they were completely blindsided 
by the fact that the Taliban came in. And I have seen a lot of blame being placed on um, the Ghani administration. Uh, and while I don't, uh, you know, I, I can't say whether he should or shouldn't have fled, uh, all, what I can say is that his government should have been involved in these discussions rather than completely ignored. And that is the reason why the Taliban had such a free path into Kabul. Matthew, do you agree? Um, there are two phases, I think, that uh, Mina's referring to that are very important. There was the early um, sort of negotiations between the US and the Taliban that completely excluded the Afghan government. And that was uh, sort of setting the stage for a number of problems that emerged later on. There was in light of those um, US Taliban negotiations, this, this so-called deal that then set up the idea that there would be negotiations between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Now, there were some conversations, but I wouldn't necessarily call them negotiations of any substance because in the meantime, of course, um, we had the declaration of um, a specific withdrawal date for, for US forces. And so the possibility of sort of shoring up those negotiations with a, a military situation that was uh, not tilting rapidly towards the Taliban was, was obviated. So in, in that sense, there was no chance really for um, the, the Afghan government to feel that it was, if you will, an active and important participant in negotiations. And I think that's what, what Mina is referring to. And, and on that, Mina, can I just ask you, I mean, when the history is written, one of the issues surely, and, and this goes to the question of the involvement of the Af Afghan government as well, is th this has been a complete failure of, of peace building. They went into, you know, in 2001, but they never, you know, the force, the Allied forces never built the structures that would have allow allowed, the civil structures that would have allowed a stronger government. Do you think that's fair? No, I don't think I don't think so. I think that the the coalition forces uh, did what they could do. Ultimately, it does lie with the Afghan people, and it does come down to uh, you know who's in charge and who wants what. Uh, one of the criticisms I've heard is that the problem lies or lay within the constitution of Afghanistan, which was the most inclusive constitution that Afghanistan has ever had. I don't think that that's true. I think that that's a good move towards unity in Afghanistan. Uh, what I will say though, is that corruption was aided and abetted by the millions of dollars that was poured in, or sorry, billions of dollars that was poured into Afghanistan and handed to corrupt organizations that, you know, that money didn't go towards nation building, it went back to the US. So, you know, it's multifaceted, it's extremely, um, nuanced and complex, but uh, ultimately, I think that had they had the coalition forces um, taken out the Taliban and Al Qaeda when they did, I think that the withdrawal should have happened sooner rather than later, and it should have been, um, you know, a, a gradual withdrawal rather than a cut and run uh, that happened. Matthew, let's go back to to who who the government is right now. And we've heard from Amin about uh, a little bit about the roles and, and the fact that, what is it, that uh, the 13 members are on the UN blacklist. We also know that it's all, all male. Are there any surprises in there? I understand that there were some, uh, I think, deputy ministerial positions that went to some ethnic groups, but is there is there any hope in the makeup of how you see the government today? I don't know if I'd turn to the word hope. Um, I think they, the government, um, as they call it, the interim government. No, I, I don't think anybody takes seriously the notion that many of these key figures are suddenly going to disappear from the stage. So I don't think interim is the right word either. Um, we see some very familiar older faces. Um, and those would be people like Mullah Baradar, for instance, who helped Mullah Omar start the Taliban. But we also see some younger faces like uh, Mullah Yaqub, who is Mullah Omar's son. Um, and we also see, as we mentioned earlier, some faces that actually came to the Taliban circle a little bit later as sort of allies of the Taliban. And these would be people like Sarajuddin Haqqani from the Haqqani Network. Um, it's a slightly different organization that has now come closer to the leadership structures of, of the Taliban. Now, as you, as you said, uh, a lot of these figures are still on UN sanctions 
license list. Uh, and so the, the, the degree to which we would see hope in uh, the structure of this, this government um, would first of all probably involve um, moving away moving away from people who are on, on those sanctions lists. And we're obviously talking about inclusiveness, whether that's ethnic inclusion or the inclusion of religious minorities. And of course, first and foremost, the inclusion of, of women. But people have also talked about um, the inclusion of members of the former regime, whether that's former President Hamid Karzai, whether that is former Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah, the idea is a national reconciliation concept. And but the idea here, here is that, does that have any, any, uh, any standing at all, do you think? Currently, no. No. Currently, it has none at all. In fact, even within the Taliban, uh, you mentioned that you know some figures are deputy figures, and really the figures that have emerged as deputy figures are what we previously called the moderates, uh, and the ones in leading positions are, are these hardliners. And, and the reason we're seeing that, uh, I think, is not just owing to the pace of the transition, which I mentioned earlier, um, but also because one of the key challengers to the Taliban are the Islamic State figures. Um, and, you know, we've talked about some of these protests and Mina mentioned some coming up in, in Kandahar and so on. Um, but if we're talking about uh, challenges to the Taliban, that we, we can't uh, leave out the, the Islamic State. And, and one of the reasons that's important uh, is because the Taliban feel that in order to prevent defections from within the Taliban um, to the Islamic State, they need to take a very, very hardline position themselves. Um, and all of those things sort of pull away from, you know, this, this word hope uh, in terms of the structure of the Afghan government. But I think you, you asked earlier whether we, whether the Taliban can multitask, whether they can do sort of domestic regime consolidation and sort of international recognition place. And, and I think it's a very good question because this move towards the hardliners cuts two ways. On the one hand, it strongly militates against recognition. Okay, at the same time, it creates such a tense and tenuous uh, security situation um, that without recognition, we may see international engagement just to address the humanitarian crisis, just to address the risk of a refugee flow. So you see already the EU saying things like they might want to reopen their office in Kabul just to manage the humanitarian budget, which is essential owing to the crisis, which is related to some of the poor governance. And so we may see a hardline government uh, leading the international community to avoid recognition, but simultaneously pulling in the international community to address some of the crises that could result. And that's the multitasking dilemma. And, and we've just, we heard from the UN this week about just the, the desperate situation and, and how worried, I referred to that BBC story, but how worried uh, international uh, authorities and particularly neighbours are about the situation. I mean, I wonder, what do you think in terms of the ability of the Taliban to, to govern? You've written a bit about their experience. I mean, even the most experienced politician or economist would find the current situation in Afghanistan challenging. How well placed are the Taliban to, to negotiate and to, I suppose, navigate their way through the challenges? I think they're going to have enormous uh, difficulties. I mean, Afghanistan uh, is a very mosaic state. It's made up of uh, uh, numerous uh, micro societies. Um, there is, uh, Afghanistan is truly a land of minorities. There is no majority group. And the Pashtuns, uh, the ethnic Pashtuns uh, to which the Taliban belong, uh, they formed some, uh, historically they formed about 42% of the Afghan population. And then that's really followed by other groups like the Tajiks and the Uzbeks and Turkmen's and Hazaras and so on. So uh, to, to, to manage Afghanistan, you really, and particularly in the present era, you have to have a national coalition to run the country. And I think it, the government will have to be very inclusive and not just inclusive of different ethnic groups and so on, but also I think it will have the gender equality in it. And that, that, that is completely really missing. And I think what the Taliban are really doing is the most cruel things that they could possibly do or any group anywhere can really do. Uh, and th that's why it is absolutely imperative for the international community to hold back uh, recognition of the Taliban until such time that they are really forced to create an inclusive government and at the same time uh, acknowledge uh, the rights of the Afghan people and particularly the right of women and the young girls and so on. Uh, they, I mean, uh, uh, you know, it was really that negotiation was mentioned between the United States and uh, the Taliban uh, earlier. 
I, I mean, for me, the moment that the United States signed the peace agreement with the Taliban in uh, February uh, 2020, uh, that's when the United States really sold out the Afghan cause altogether. But of course, that's not the only factor. But Afghanistan, uh, yes, the Afghan government should have been really included in all the discussion. But on the other hand, you have a government which has become incredibly unpopular, incredibly corrupt, incredibly dysfunctional. And so it is not that the Afghans have just been betrayed by, perhaps by foreign powers as they have been over the last two centuries. You know, the Brits uh, betrayed them, the Soviets betrayed them, and now the Americans. But also they've been betrayed by their own leaders. Their leaders have proved to be totally ineffective and to, to very self-centered, very self-seeking, uh, self rather than really doing whatever is really needed to, to create national unity and bring prosperity to a wide range of Afghans in the country. And that has not really happened. At Mina, if we look at that point that you know that Amin was just saying that the, the uh, international community should not recognize until action is taken. But I guess this is the struggle for the international community, isn't it? It's a, it's a question of recognizing without, not sorry, it's a question of, of helping without legitimizing. And how, how do you see that playing out at the moment? We just heard Matthew talk about, you know, the, where, the, where the international community might be forced to be. We know the UN is already involved. Uh, do you see Pakistan as taking the lead on this in terms of becoming the international broker um, you know, they've been playing an interesting game for decades now. How do you see that all playing out? That's a, that's a very diplomatic way of putting that question, Ali. Um, Pakistan has only gained from the destruction of Afghanistan of the last, uh, since its inception, really. Um, and I say that, and there's, there's quite a bit of rhetoric out there that, you know, uh, our viewers can go and read. So it's not that I'm just pulling this out of the air. Um, but I'll go back to the, the beginning of your question. What's interesting is what Matt raised about the ISIS uh, or IS, ISIS-K or whatever they're called um, in Afghanistan. The problem is that with if, if the international community was to have any kind of presence in Afghanistan other than a humanitarian presence, ISIS will um, attack more. And so, uh, so in, in order to kind of balance that, it's probably wiser for the international community not to be in there. However, the flip side of that is that the Taliban will not be able to contain ISIS-K. That, I will say this, you know, very openly, the Taliban does not have the capacity to be able to contain ISIS-K. As far as the Pakistan question is concerned, I hope that the neighbours, the other neighbours, uh, step up. Because as far as Afghans are concerned, Pakistan is not a friend. Pakistan has always utilized the destruction of Afghanistan for its gain. Um, and, you know, right now, it, there's, a, uh, there's a meeting happening in Iran where all the foreign ministers of all the neighboring countries of Afghanistan are coming together to discuss Afghanistan. I'm glad that it's in Iran. Um, you know, Iran has its own problems, its own issues with Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, they're not... Uh, completely, um, uh, completely, I suppose, innocent either when it comes to Afghanistan. However, Pakistan has not been a friend of Afghanistan, not now, not ever. Can I, can I just come in on that point? I mean, the uh, foreign ministers uh, of uh, neighboring states uh, plus uh, Russia uh, uh, have just issued a statement uh, on a Tehran uh, conference. Uh, and in that, uh, they, uh, there is no mention of formal recognition of the Taliban government. Uh, but at the same time, also Pakistan is, is excused uh, for its support uh, for the Taliban. Uh, there is no mention of that either. So the, 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 the communique which has been issued is a very muted one in a lot of ways. But at least uh, it, it is uh, important in the sense that uh, the foreign ministers have not explicitly stated that, that they will move towards recognizing the Taliban regime. Uh, but at the same time, they have really called for international engagement with the Taliban for humanitarian purposes. So that is really to provide uh, or to avoid a, a massive humanitarian catastrophe which Afghanistan is heading towards at the moment. 
Matthew, how do you see the role of, and not just Pakistan, I guess, but also other neighbours? And, and it is notable that, that Pakistan was the first of very few countries to recognise the Taliban back in uh, the early 2000s. Do you think that they will do that again? So I don't think that Pakistan is rushing to recognize uh, the Taliban. I think of all the countries that we might expect to recognize the Taliban, the Pakistanis would be at the front of the list. Um, but even six months ago, I was saying that I don't think Pakistan wants a total Taliban takeover. Um, and I still think that Pakistan is a little bit nervous about uh, the pace of events and this uh, hardline government and so on, um, partly because this government maintains links um, that this Taliban interim government maintains links to groups like Al Qaeda, groups like um, the Pakistan Taliban, which are an anti-Pakistan group in, inside the Taliban, and some of them shelter inside Afghanistan. And so Pakistan is very concerned about, about groups like that. And they want the Afghan Taliban to take action against these so-called Pakistan Taliban who will attack the Pakistani state. In fact, the Pakistan government asked the Afghan Taliban to do something about uh, the Pakistan Taliban and actually the Afghan Taliban simply told Pakistan that they should turn to Pakistan's own clerics and ask those clerics whether they thought that the Pakistan Taliban fight against the Pakistan state was quote legitimate. So needless to say, Pakistan was not satisfied that uh, the Afghan Taliban had Pakistan's interests in mind there. And so I don't think Pakistan is going to rush to recognize the Taliban. I think that they will continue to try to put pressure on the Afghan Taliban um, and, and hope uh, with many other neighboring states uh, that they can encourage some pattern of moderation um, within that regime. We'll see. Does the Taliban have any friends? I'm just going to jump in there, if that's okay, and just say that I've referred to um, the Taliban as Pakistan's Frankenstein monster, uh, which they have tried to control, and it's failed them before. It will fail them again. Um, as far as your does, do the Taliban have any friends is concerned, Saudi Arabia came out not recently and, and said that they will not be recognizing the Taliban. So, you know, going back to the first regime of the Taliban, Saudi Arabia was, I think, country number two that recognized them. So do they have any friends? I don't think so. I mean, well, I, I think uh, Pakistan is uh, waiting to see which other country will come uh, forward and recognize the Taliban first. I think at this stage, probably they are very much betting on China. Uh, but the, the Taliban have declared uh, China as uh, their um, business partner. And also the Chinese foreign minister has just had a meeting in Doha uh, with Malo brother and his uh, delegation. And it, it is, uh, it, Beijing has also announced a $5 million humanitarian aid and of course, that's on the top of another $31 million that they had uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, I, I think uh, at this point, Pakistan finds it very expedient to sit back a little bit and let one other power to come forward and recognize the Taliban. And then you, you can expect the Taliban, uh, the Pakistanis to also extend the recognition. I mean, formal recognition. I mean, at the moment, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the relationship between the Pakistan and more specifically Pakistan military and even more specifically than that Pakistan's military intelligence, which is the most powerful force in uh, running Pakistan behind the scenes. Uh, 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 its relationship with the Taliban is one of uh, uh, a patron client relationship. Uh, I don't believe for, for a minute that, that the Taliban will take any concrete steps in, uh, in, in any direction without the support and instructions from the Pakistan military intelligence. Uh, I mean, that has been very much evident in the last uh, two months. Now, the first dignitary to visit the Taliban is the head of the Pakistan ISI to come to, to Kabul in order to uh, sort out the differences between the Taliban and to, uh, how to distribute the power among themselves. And of course, uh, the difference between the Haqqani network, you know, in other words, the uh, groups from Eastern Afghanistan, which is called the Mashriq group, and of course, the group from Kandahar. The group from Kandahar is a little bit more nuanced and not really as hardline as the group from the, the Eastern uh, uh, provinces. And then of course, the second person who comes and visit the, the Taliban and have consultation with the Taliban, 
is the Pakistan foreign minister, which just really visited uh, visited Kabul, um, uh, and uh, at the same time, the uh, Pakistani uh, ambassador in Kabul, who is now perhaps the most powerful individual in the country, uh, 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 announced that uh, Afghanistan should really join the Built and Road initiatives of China, uh, and particularly the China-Pakistan economic corridor. So in other words, to integrate Afghanistan, not just politically, but also economically into Pakistan. So, so I mean, can I ask you, what, what is Pakistan's ultimate aim uh, or interest with Afghanistan? Is it expanding its sphere of control? Is it stability on its border? Is it one up on India? Is it economic? What, what's the overriding interest? I think the overriding interest, I mean, the, uh, I think we can look at it in three areas. One is the border issue between Afghanistan and Pakistan, which has been a sticking point of, since the creation of the uh, 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 Pakistan in 1947. But of course, the Pakistan is inherited it from British India, uh, but it, 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 it became a major point of dispute between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, th that was really never settled. It, uh, uh, and of course, the Afghanistan had its own purposes in emphasizing the border dispute and Pakistan's refusal to really, uh, to really negotiate that for the dispute where it had its own objectives. Um, I think with the note the Taliban being in power, as it was really the case before when the Taliban was there in, in the 1990s, the issue of the uh, border dispute is gone, it's finished. The second thing is that the Pashtun, ethnic Pashtuns in Afghanistan form something like about, uh, you know, 40% of the population or something, there's altogether something like about probably at this stage, 15 to 16 million. But of course they're divided between different uh, the, uh, tribes. You know, you've got the Durrani tribe, the Ghazai tribe, and it's very interesting in, in, enough the, uh, to the, the, the Taliban, they belong to the Ghazai um, uh, tribe uh, uh, of Afghanistan. And so that uh, Ashraf Ghani, the former president who fled the country, and, uh, and the uh, uh, UN ambassador who negotiated with the Taliban, Zalmay Khalizat, he's also come from a Ghazali tribe background. And so it's all very interesting that's sort of really you now coming together and it become a tra tragedy uh, for Afghanistan. So one was the borders dispute. And the second thing is, of course, the conflict between India and Pakistan. I mean, this is a one-man upship as far as Pakistan is concerned. They have really won the fight uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, the, uh, the Pakistanis uh, have in the past talked about the strategic depth that they could use Afghanistan as a backyard in the event of a conflict with India. And now they have, as far as they're concerned, they've really achieved, uh, achieved that. And the third thing is that, that of course, you know, there is a you know, very close relationship, the strategic relationship between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. And uh, there is a, uh, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And uh, uh, as far as the uh, Pakistanis are concerned, it is very important that, that they have control over Afghanistan. That would really please also our rich uh, Saudi Arabia, which uh, uh, is in a play, uh, position to donate a lot of money to, uh, uh, to, uh, to Pakistan. And that also, in some ways, keep Iran at bay to a considerable extent, because Iran's relationship with India has, has been really good because the uh, Iranians have been developing the port of Shabahar in the, uh, or participating in the development of Shabahar in Iran on the Gulf uh, in order to find direct access to Afghanistan and to Central Asia and thus bypass Pakistan. So in a way, Afghanistan's conflict has been um, entangled with these regional problems and the, all these regional problems have not gone. And this is not really the end of the matter. This is not the end of the conflict in Afghanistan either. I think as far as I can see, Afghanistan conflict is just entering another phase. Matthew, can I, can I ask you, because if you look at that, that entanglement with regional forces, and then you've also, we can explore China a little bit more as well. But I guess that sort of raises the question of whether there can be any external pressure brought to bear on the Taliban or whether they are, uh, as Amin would put it, beholden to the to Pakistan, but otherwise immune from from international pressure. I think one of the things that I'll be watching is the degree to which the Taliban become agents in this story. Um, we, of course, have this view that um, Pakistan would like nothing more than a client state in in Afghanistan, and and they appear closer to that objective than, than ever before. And and if their rivalry in Afghanistan was really a rivalry with with India. 
Well, then the removal of the Ghani government, in the, which was close to India, uh, and the arrival of the, the Taliban government is a victory for Pakistan. However, as soon as this occurred, um, we see the Taliban with their state trying to carve out a little bit of autonomy. Um, and I think that that's the thing to watch. Um, will the Taliban be able to talk to Iran, talk to China, work with Russia, maybe, and, and find a way to navigate a little bit of a negotiated leverage uh, with some of these other regional powers that will give them a little bit of play, even when that means not necessarily towing the line of Pakistan. So for instance, when the Taliban talk to Iran, they have a conduit to India. Pakistan would like nothing less, but that's part of what happens. And so I think the Taliban will try to create a little bit of autonomy and move away from this pattern of simply being a client. So I think, I think Manch is giving the Taliban more credibility than perhaps they deserve. I mean, uh, as far as I can see- More aspiration. Yeah, well, aspiration, I think probably that's a better word. Um, but I, I, I mean, at this stage, there is no major competition over Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan problem is entangled with all these problems, regional problems, but there's, there's no competition over Afghanistan. I mean, some people talking about a great game as being played out and so on, because the United States is out of it. The Western Alliance is out of it altogether. Yes, during the Cold War, this was a major issue and the Afghan governments were able to play off the two superpowers against one another to the advantage of Afghanistan. And they did it, they did it very successfully. But I mean, at this stage, as far as the United States is out and doesn't have much leverage in Afghanistan. And, and, and that, that yeah. I was gonna say, can I, let me put that to, to Mina because I guess that's the, this is the other really obvious question is uh, the US, Europe, uh, Australia, the longest war, how is that going to inform what they do now? What is the, uh, I suppose, the moral imperative from where they go now? Um, look, I, I will talk about the moral imperative, but let me just bring in the whole question of India into this and where that comes into play. Uh, the importance of India as a partner to Australia and the US and the UK is huge. If the Taliban, by any way, shape or form, embolden um, terrorists within India, or particularly within the Kashmir region, and embolden Pakistan in any way, shape or form, that does not mean good things for India. And as a result, we will feel the ripple effects because of our uh, arrangements with India. So where I'll be looking is what's going to happen with India and how will India react to all of this? Because India so far has been very eerily quiet and they've just been, you know, speaking to the US and speaking to uh, the UK and Australia and Japan with the um, uh, with the, the quad. oh, the, the quad. With the quad. That's it. Sorry, forgot it. Um, yeah, with the quad, and so uh, and and you know, trying to get involved with AUKUS, etc. So for me, I think that India is going to be the strategic player here, and it all the uh, basically uh, it will determine which way the moral compass swings depending on how India reacts to all of this. Which, I mean, the moral compass being incredibly important also from the context of, of women and human rights more broadly in Afghanistan. And I know uh, that, Mina, that you've written or you've made the comment that there's a lot of conversation about foreign policy in Afghanistan that paints women as victims or ignores them completely. Can you talk a bit about that? Because it, it as, as an outsider, it seems to me that it is often discussed, not necessarily anything is done about it, but those issues are often at the forefront of how we view Afghanistan. Yeah, so look, I mean, in the last, I mean, as imperfect as the Ghani administration was, the representation of women was actually fantastic and we've got to call that for what it is. Uh, and so we can't take that credit away from the fact that women were represented women were given a seat at the table, they are no longer. And unfortunately, the US administration, both the Trump and also the Biden administration has not consulted women, has not looked out for their rights and their um, emancipation. Uh, and as a result, what we're seeing is that all these women that we've given the, the, the freedoms and the, um, uh, I suppose, strength to be leaders in that country and to push it forward have been completely ignored whether it's through the negotiations, whether it's through uh, the fact that right now, and I say, you know, that 
it depends on where the moral compass will fall because women are being ignored. Uh, right now, if you have a look at the fact that there is an entire generation of girls who have not gone to school for almost two months. I mean, how is that acceptable? You can't blame Islam for that. There is no Islamic country in the entire world that, that says no to the education of girls. So that, that can't be an excuse. What's going on? These schools were already segregated. Uh, you know, so as a result of the fact that women and girls are seeing their rights just turn to ash on a daily basis and, and the protests that are taking place, that should tell you that right now the moral compass of the world is kind of missing. Um, and I bring it back to India because, unfortunately, the moral compass of the world is very much entangled with the geopolitical issues that are, uh, you know, important to the world. I do want to, I want to open this up to questions. I'm just watching the, the Q&A. So if you've got a question, uh, pop it into the Q&A queue. Is that the way to do it? And I'll put it to you. And I just, I'll put this question to you, Matthew, because it goes to this issue of, of recognition. Uh, Jay Sung says that China and North Korea are likely to be the first countries will recognise the Taliban-run Afghanistan. Can anyone tell us about the defence capabilities of the Taliban government? Any possibility they might have access to weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear? Would they be a threat to regional and international security? Should we in Australia be worried? Uh, fortunately, to my knowledge, uh, the Taliban currently have no access to uh, nuclear weapons. Um, there is a concern, obviously, that their um, longtime associates in the Pakistan Taliban will somehow uh, manage to destabilize Pakistan and, and somehow access Pakistan's nuclear weapons. That seems a long way off. Um, so, so in that sense, I don't think we see um, weapons of mass destruction style um, threats to, to international security. What we do see, however, are concerns about safe havens for international terrorists, exactly the sort of thing that, that we worried about before 9-11 and after 9-11. So um, that's why the uh, battle with Islamic State is, is so important. That's why all the regional states, including Pakistan, China, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, they're all interested in whether the Taliban will allow counterterrorism collaboration uh, and, and so far already the Taliban have said, no, we will not cooperate with the United States on counterterrorism cooperation against Islamic State. Now, as Mina said earlier, she does not think that the Taliban alone uh, can, can sort of tackle, tackle Islamic State, simultaneously saying that maybe the US won't necessarily be a key partner, but other regional states could. Um, that is the sort of thing that, that people will be looking at with reference to international security. I, I'm not necessarily sure that China will be the first uh, state to recognize uh, Pakistan, uh, recognize the Taliban government in Afghanistan. I think what we'll see is sort of a, um, a team effort from a, a number of like-minded states. China's work in, in Afghanistan passes through its close engagement with Pakistan. Um, and so that, that will probably continue. So if China recognizes, Pakistan will recognize at exactly the same time. So I wouldn't necessarily see China going first. China also, though, has that, that real security imperative as well with the Uyghurs, don't they? I mean, they're, they're, it's not, it's, <laughs> that's yeah. just a big, as exactly. big an issue for them as it is for, for example, America worried about terrorism. In exactly the same way that I said, uh, Pakistan was concerned about what's happening in Afghanistan because they worry about groups that the Afghan Taliban are close to, like the Pakistan Taliban that threatened Pakistan. The Chinese are also worried about what's happening in Afghanistan because they're worried about groups like the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, um, which is a Uyghur movement that is um, sort of encouraging uh, change in, in Western China. And so just as Pakistan would like to see moderation and counterterrorism work in, in uh, Afghanistan, China would also like to see moderation and counterterrorism work in Afghanistan. Um, but China is also finding that its leverage is surprisingly limited. As I said earlier, the international pressure on Afghanistan has basically been put on the back burner until the, until the Afghan Taliban feel that they've consolidated power domestically. And, and that's unfortunate. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, of course, it's very interesting that the Taliban uh, have remained uh, uh, extremely quiet on the issue of Uyghurs in uh, uh, Xinjiang province uh, altogether. I mean, I think um, the Taliban are doing everything possible to persuade uh, Beijing uh, to be the first uh, 
uh, capital to recognize the Taliban and also to resume uh, trade and uh, uh, economic ties with the Taliban and uh, also uh, participate in the completion and initiation of a number of uh, industrial projects in the country, infrastructural uh, projects in the country. And I think that uh, uh, the foreign minister of uh, uh, China has uh, indicated very clearly to the Taliban that they would be very happy uh, to come in. But at the same time, I should really um, uh, uh, say that uh, uh, the Chinese are also going to be uh, uh, cautious because uh, look, the Americans have burned their fingers in Afghanistan. The Soviets burned their fingers in Afghanistan. And, and China is not really going to be uh, caught up in the same net. And it doesn't really want to uh, walk into Afghanistan and to, uh, therefore uh, uh, really instead of uh, exploiting all those untapped mineral resources of Afghanistan to its benefit, but uh, getting uh, uh, itself uh, involved in a situation from which you may not be able to extricate itself very easily. We've got another question from the audience. To, I'll put to Mina. Um, I, I'm doing this randomly, I should say. Um, do the guests have any opinions on possible ways that the Taliban's constitutional preference for their own Sunni Hanafi school of jurisprudence might attempt to reconcile intra-faith Islamic differences, if at all? I'm no expert on Islam. So I, I will say that uh, it's interesting that the Taliban are pretty much begging Beijing for recognition and for support. Beijing ideologically could not be further away from any kind of uh, any kind of faith, let alone Islam. So that in itself shows that the Taliban are opportunistic. They will do what they need to do to get ahead and to be recognised and to uh, establish their government. But as far as you know, the Hanafi. Um, uh, ideology is concerned and what that means for other uh, sects, I can't see them having a, a, an inclusive Islamic country. Um, at least, I mean, look, the last Jew of Afghanistan left when these Taliban came in. Not even he saw that, you know, it was worth fighting for. The Sikhs left. These are other religions, obviously. Within the country, from what I'm seeing, is minority uh, Muslims or minority Shias especially are leaving in droves because they are so worried. So the short answer from me is no, but like I said, I'm no expert on Islam. I can come in on this. Um, the Taliban have said that they want to uh, work with, but also Islamize the 1964 constitution that was put in place by Afghanistan's last king, Zahir Shah. That constitution privileged the, the Hanafi school of, of Sunni um, religious legal interpretation. And so the, the Taliban say that they're going to uh, work with that tradition in mind, but basically take it much further. Um, it's the taking it much further part that really closes this window on questions about intra-faith Islamic differences. Because the Taliban are, to my knowledge, um, so far unique in the world in so far as they say Hanafi only um, jurisprudence and don't further recognize other uh, schools of Islam, schools of uh, legal interpretation or other religions. So for instance, if you look at constitutions in Iran, uh, they, they stress the, a particular school of um, religious legal thinking, the Jafari school of Shia thinking. Um, but they, their constitution goes on to say, and we also recognize other schools <laughs> of, of Muslim legal thinking. And then it goes on to say, and we recognize other religions as well. Um, if you go to Brunei, uh, Brunei also says, we recognize uh, one school of Sunni legal thinking, this Shafi school. And then it goes on to say, and we recognize other religions. So what, what we see in the case of the Taliban is a, a privileging of one school, this Hanafi school of, of Sunni thinking, but only that. And that really is important to highlight because it shows the Taliban um, departing from really any other Islamic constitutional tradition ever. <laughs> um, and, and saying we are not going to do interfaith or intrafaith uh, recognition of differences. And that is uh, extremely important within their own orbit of thinking. But, but even in the case of uh, Hanafi, uh, sect in, uh, in Afghanistan. And of course, a, a great majority of uh, um, uh, Afghan population uh, is followers of uh, Hanafi school of Islam. But the Taliban has 
their own interpretation of the Hanafi style, which is very strict and very extreme. Hanafi uh, 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 school is supposed to be more flexible uh, compared to, to other three schools in Islam. And yet the Taliban are implementing the uh, very harsh and very strict uh, version of Hanafi and Islam. Because Hanafi Islam does not really, for example, uh, engage in such measures which could deprive women of their, uh, uh, their rights. Uh, the, uh, uh, Hanafi Islam uh, sector does not really prescribe that women should not be educated. Women should not be allowed to work. Uh, yes, it may say that you know the woman uh, would have to be decently presented, but th that is different from preventing women from uh, working, being educated, and participating in, the, uh, uh, in building uh, uh, the destiny of their nation and the destiny of, uh, uh, in, in their own lives. That's not that's that's not what Hanafi is from. Is it, is Absolutely. Can I just say that, um, you know, I mean, is exactly right. Just privileging the, the Hanafi school is not necessarily the only issue. It's also interpreting that tradition. So the Hanafi school is also the school that is prevailing in Turkey or in amongst Muslims, mostly in India uh, and so on and so forth. And so um, what I was mentioning earlier is just the unique features of their constitutional vision. But then the practice of interpretation is really what distinguishes their, their um, experience. We, we are almost out of time, but there's a question here from Pierre, which allows me to sort of give each of you a chance to maybe throw this forward a little. Um, Pierre does thank you all for the, for the quality of our speakers this evening, but also ask what needs to take place to reignite the economy and make cash available to people, because of course winter is around the corner. And if I go, I mean, if I can go to you first, because you made the comment before that the Taliban will do anything that it thinks that it needs to do to get what it wants, in essence, to paraphrase. So that would dictate, wouldn't it, that they would put women in their government. They would allow, because that is what the international community wants. And if they do that, they, you know, they are going to open, uh, open their economy to, to much better times. So I suppose, how do you see that uh, desperate need coming up against their firm beliefs and where uh, optimistic or pessimistic about finding a way through that? Ali, I, I am a very pessimistic when it comes to the Taliban. I cannot, you know, my theory is you do not negotiate with terrorists and I will stand by that. Um, from where I see things happening is that I still believe that they are opportunistic. I think that they will perhaps allow women to take some form of um, place in society other than remaining at home, not being heard, not being seen. Uh, but it will come with very strict guidelines and it will come with very strict rules as to what they can and can't do and how they can and can't dress. Um, as far as having any hope for women in Afghanistan under the Taliban is concerned, I don't think that we have any hope under the Taliban. I mean, it, it could possibly happen that if something is negotiated where there's a share of power with uh, someone from the previous administration, whether that's Karzai or um, uh, Mr. Abdullah Abdullah, whoever that is, maybe perhaps we can see some sort of a change in whatever kind of a government is going to come into Afghanistan, which is an inclusive government, which includes members of the Taliban. I'm hoping not the likes of Haqqani, et cetera, but I, I have no hope. I'm sorry. Like I, I cannot... Um, I can't see a future for women in that country. Uh, Mina, can, sorry, Amin, can I ask you, and, and also, I mean, not just for women, but that broader question of, of what can be done now that will stave off this impending disaster, humanitarian disaster? Well, first of all, I think it is very important for international community to extend uh, humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. Um, and they can do it uh, through international agencies and uh, directly to the Afghan people, not necessarily through the Taliban government. Of course, they would need the cooperation of the Taliban uh, uh, administration. Uh, and uh, for that, I mean, they need to engage and talk to the Taliban. But that should not in any way 
amounted to a recognition of the Taliban until or the recognition of the Taliban government. Until such time, the Taliban have changed their direction. But it's going to be very difficult, as was pointed out. It's difficult for the Taliban to change their direction because what is really important for them at the moment is the unity of their own movement. And if they try to depart from that harsh ideological position that they've adopted, that could cause a lot of problems within the movement itself. I mean, for example, the, I mean, as Matthew pointed out, the Haqqani uh, group is very much in control of the security of Kabul. And very much, in, in fact, they have gained the upper hand uh, um, compared to, to uh, their Kandahari uh, counterparts and so on. Uh, and I think the Kandahari uh, leadership, they would like to really see that the movement remained quite really united. And that's why there's very little prospect for the Taliban uh, to uh, create the kind of inclusive government and acknowledge the kind of human rights which could possibly uh, provide the necessary moral, ethical, and indeed um, political grounds for the international community to recognize the, the, the Taliban regime. I mean, at the moment, yes, they've allowed some of the uh, uh, girls' schools to open, for example, in Mazar Sharif. Uh, but the point is that even if these girls are going to school and they finish the school, then there is no hope for them after that. There is no employment, there is no opportunities under the Taliban rule. So I think the important thing is that this regime will have to change and will have to change to the extent which is acceptable to the Afghan people and to the international community. And that means authority, inclusive government. And I mean, if they don't, it just very briefly is the risk that they will, they will collapse under the weight of their own problems. If they can't feed their people, well, they, I mean, they could, but also so, so would the Afghan people. I mean, at the moment, uh, uh, 20 million Afghan, uh, Afghans are facing starvation. Uh, uh, so it's not just that the Taliban will collapse under the uh, weight of its own problems, but no. so with the Afghan people. So I think the, the international community will have to have a very clear and coherent strategy how to deal with the Afghanistan crisis at the moment. It's not an issue which can be only resolved by the Afghan people at this point, or for that matter, by the neighbors of Afghanistan. I think it will have to be a collective decision on the part of the international community as a whole. And I think the United Nations will have to take the lead in this respect. And that's for the first time that perhaps the United Nations could prove to be more effective in conflict resolution than it has been this, uh, up to this point. Matthew, can I give you the last word? How do you see, uh, I suppose, the future? Any, are you more optimistic at all? No, um, I, I think that the tensions within the Taliban um, will, for the time being, um, reinforce this hardline pattern that we're so concerned about, which makes the, the trend that Amin was just saying is necessary harder to achieve. That moderating trend will be harder to achieve. In the meantime, however, um, I think Pierre's question is very important, which is winter is coming, it's going to be a very, very hard winter. How do you turn on the money? Um, and, and that question, I think, is, um, is answerable in a couple of ways. One is there are lots of humanitarian organizations that worked in Afghanistan when the Taliban were in control before. There is some experience um, with this type of situation, and it is bleak. Um, but there is some conduit for and experience with um, humanitarian assistance in this circumstance. Most of that experience really suggests um, a highly localized pattern of negotiation with individual Taliban commanders in local uh, contexts, um, which creates a certain ad hoc, arbitrary um, sort of dimension, which these organizations have some experience navigating, but produces profound inequalities within the country. Having said that, the, you know, the US Treasury, we said earlier that the US is out of the game. Game, but in a certain way, the US is still in the game, uh, which is that they're, they're holding a lot of Afghan reserves. And I, I cannot see those reserves being released to the Afghan Taliban government. Um, what I can see is what we've seen a little bit of so far, which is the Treasury modifying its sanctions regime to allow uh, humanitarian organizations to, if you will, pay fees, pay import duties, pay certain licenses um, that will allow for the flow of food and medicines and so on into Afghanistan um, without breaking the sanctions regime by engaging particular individuals who face sanctions. Um, alongside that trickle uh, through humanitarian assistance, we may see 
efforts to step up assistance from China, Pakistan, Qatar, Turkey. Um, but, but given the need, uh, given sort of the financial need and given the challenge, just the bureaucratic challenges of passing through the Taliban regime to get money to where it actually needs to go. You know, Pierre's question was, how do we make cash available to people? Mm -hmm. um, and, and now we have to sort of work through as a humanitarian uh, community, work through that regime. And that is going to be enormously difficult. So I would say in the meantime, it's going to be a very, very, very bleak winter. Well, there are a number of international agencies working at the moment in Afghanistan. CARE is still very active and is even recruiting uh, employees. Uh, and so, so is the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, very active. So there are a number of international organizations who would, uh, as, as long as the uh, international community and particularly the United States and the members of the Western Alliance uh, reach some sort of uh, understanding with the Taliban, uh, to allow these aids to get into the country, then just the international uh, organization could actually manage the distribution of food. And it, and it has to be done very soon. The winter is upon them. Absolutely. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to grasp that as a slightly positive uh, move, that at least if, we, if they're there. Alice, they, they, and they, can, I just, can I just add to that, um, that I have a list of about five grassroots organizations that are being run by people around the country or around the world really one in particular is being run by two doctors from melbourne who used to work in afghanistan um, and they're doing amazing amazing work so if anyone is interested in donating directly to the people these are grassroots organizations not affiliated with any of the larger organizations feel free to reach out i'd love to share that with you Mm, terrific. Look, a huge thank you to Matthew and to Armin and to Mina uh, from me. And I'm just going to, and thank you also for your wonderful questions. I'm just going to hand over now to Scarlett for, for the um, official thank you. Unmute. Thank you so much, Ali, Matt, uh, Mina and Armin for what was a really thoughtful discussion around a complicated topic. So thank you for your time tonight. And thank you to our attendees who joined via Facebook or via Zoom. Uh, and we have been recording this event, so um, I'll make sure the recording is available in the next coming days on the Melbourne Asia Review website, uh, but I'll also email a link directly to everyone who um, registered for the Zoom webinar. So thank you again to our presenters. We'll leave it there for tonight, just after six, but take care, uh, enjoy your evening and see you next time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, everyone.